Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for attending this peer review multiple sclerosis uh, CMSC satellite symposium. Uh, it's an honor to be standing here with uh, other speakers. Uh, I want to introduce Dr. Stephen Krieger first and then Dr. Lori Meyer. And we are going to be talking today about the idea of, of shared decision making. And we'll do so as a didactic lectures mixed with stories from uh, clinical practice. This audio is part of a certified educational activity titled Guiding Patients Through the Risks and Benefits of Disease-Modifying Therapy, Patient Stories of Shared Decision-Making Throughout the Course of Multiple Sclerosis. To access the entire activity and complete the post-test, please go online to www.peerviewpress.com forward slash xdg. A printable monograph, slides, practice aids, and other features are also available. So I'm going to go through two parts. Uh, first, the introduction, and then a more didactic session. First of all, what I'm going to be just trying to describe is the need for this shared decision making. Uh, we've had uh, an explosion of medications since I've been in practice for 25 years. There were none when I started, and now I have an entire slide filled with words. And so that is, that's a lot of medications that have launched. We can sort of break it into a group before 2010 and after 2010, but it's been a pretty, pretty steady stream of medications with injectables, orals, and infusible products. And having these, this plethora of choices now has certainly complicated the conversations that we have with patients. And we've known forever that we need to individualize care. That's nothing that I need to tell anybody here in this room. But the, the factors that are driving our decision-making process is changing now, certainly. And we have more to talk about with patients in terms of their role in the decision process of what medications to use. So the, the concept of this is that, first of all, the people who are recommending medication need to understand the medicines themselves. It does start with that. And so the understanding of how these medicines work, how they're different from one another, and what the goals are for treatment have to be firmly entrenched in our minds before we have this conversation. But then that goes into an open conversation that we'll have with, with somebody with multiple sclerosis where we impart that information, and then we have to get feedback from them. We have to understand what their thoughts are about this as well. So we're talking about expectations, we're talking about risks as well. So this goes to effective self-management, which can lead to better satisfaction and adherence, and uh, obviously with that comes downstream the clinical outcomes and the quality of life that we're looking for in the treatment of MS. And so the importance of this decision-making process should be very obvious. It's not just the patient that's involved in this. The other key ingredient that's going around this loop is the care partner and caregiver. Their opinion can have extra extraordinary weight um, for the patient to determine what their decision process is going to be, what their goals and concerns are. So we want to get this information from people as quickly as possible so we can move forward with the plan. We don't really want to get into a situation where we're just going over the same topic over and over again and not able to actually proceed with the conversation. So if we set our goals, tailor the, the, the conversation to what we feel is most necessary, that can lead to the better outcomes. So the concept of doing this conversation with patients uh, doesn't really imply that it's done all at once. Uh, quite often, that's not practical at all. So it has to be div divided. You can say that it can be divided into a talk about the choice, and then the options, and then making the decision. And so is that three appointments? Is that one very long appointment? Well, it may be uh, you know, demanded that a decision be made early for a patient and they come in already with choice and options in their mind, but they may not. We have to be willing to be able to at least have uh, a separation in time on conversations so that we can lead to the, the, the decision that's best. What can we do to try and get this information? It includes some things that are uh, accessible to us and to our patients uh, that aren't part of the normal conversation, something beyond just the words in the conversation. So we have questionnaires that are available, and these are going to be made online for you as well. You may want to use these. These are short item questionnaires that the patients can take. So uh, it's a nine-item shared decision-making questionnaire. 
And I think these are questions that can be very informative to healthcare providers to be able to say what their mindset is about the, the choice that they have to make. And the satisfaction questionnaire for medication is also very important for those patients who have ongoing treatment to find out where they stand in terms of their satisfaction, which can, of course, impact their adherence to the treatment plan. And then lastly, you'll hear from Dr. Krieger at length about the MS Topography app that is now available to uh, help the patients understand the disease process better and what the goals for treatment might be. So we're going to go on to discuss what is the agenda for today. We're going to be examining the efficacy of the approved disease-modifying treatments for relapsing forms of MS. We're going to focus on that today. And then after I've had that conversation, Dr. Krieger will come up and we'll turn to the patients with highly active or worsening relapsing MS and discussing the, the decision processes that go into, into that very difficult situation. And then last, Dr. Mayer is going to come up and we're going to discuss the, uh, the AE profiles and we're going to have the, the decision process that goes into the conversation about tolerability and safety of these medications. So each one of these didactic sessions is going to be followed by a story which I hope will encapsulate the, the, the concepts that we're trying to get across today. So let's talk now about uh, engaging the patients in care. Where are we with this? The science behind the story. First of all, we've had these, uh, some medications around now for 20 years. Uh, and so when we're talking about glutamate acetate or beta interferons, we have a number of different products now within these categories. And the, uh, the pivotal trials to get these approved were based on the outcome measures that had been accepted by the FDA all during this time. So it was based on reduction in relapses and decrease in MRI outcomes, but uh, also decreased disability progression. Uh, that every trial is a primary outcome measure. If it's a pivotal trial, has to have decreased relapses or decreased disability progression as part of its approval process. So you can see that uh, there has been uh, testing on patients who have clinically isolated syndrome, not yet confirmed uh, relapsing multiple sclerosis, and the check marks are by those medications that have had clinical trials proving that. And you see the relapses and the MRI endpoints are across the board. And then lastly, disability progression. Because of the design of different clinical trials and how they're looking and how it was powered, they may or may not have been able to show that as well as a reduction in relapse rate. Then after we had these uh, medications, these injectables on the market for some time, we, we wanted to see whether there was a comparative efficacy there. And we have several uh, trials that were designed to have head-to-head -head, uh, comparisons. You see the beyond the regard and the evidence trial mentioned here. And the idea was to get uh, some semblance of understanding about the relative benefits of these medications to see whether there were differences to inform us if a patient was not doing well on one medicine or didn't tolerate well on that medication, whether there were other choices that might work as well or even better. And we had mixed outcomes on these. Sometimes the efficacy trials did show positive outcome and that one was found superior in one way or another to a, another medication, but other times they didn't find meaningful differences in, in other trials as well. When we got to the oral medications, we were going to have the same questions about it. How effective are these drugs? And uh, also uh, to be able to decide whether they were comparable to the injectable medicines or to each other. And so we now have three oral medications that are FDA approved. And again, you could look at it from the standpoint of CIS conversion to relapsing MS or again, the outcome measures that we expect from the FDA, which is decrease in relapses or decrease in disability progression. And what you can see with these, uh, these trials is sometimes that two trials are done simultaneously and they get somewhat different results. And uh, when that does happen, uh, sometimes you don't get uh, a clear picture. Uh, we have had studies uh, on two of the three medicines where one of them showed disability progression as being significantly different for the medicine versus placebo and another trial not having that. And so that is, uh, I think, information that we take when we look at the difference in the patient populations or try and get an understanding of why that is. Often it is a difference in how the 
population who were treated with placebo behave, that sometimes it's not as predictable as we would like. Uh, we may assume that there is going to be a certain percentage of people going on to have worsened disability over a one or two year period. And then it turns out because of patient selection, maybe picking milder patients to go into the clinical trial, that they never reach that number for the placebo, making it very difficult to actually find a, a statistical significance in the treatment group. So we do have these head-to-head -head trials that were attempted between uh, the oral medications and the injectable medications. We have the TRANSFORMS trial, which was fingolimod, compared against beta-1A interferon intramuscularly every week. We have the TENER trial, which was the teraflunamod, also compared to, to uh, interferon, but the 44 microgram subcutaneous dosage. And then lastly, the CONFIRM, which had an exploratory arm that was required by European authorities, not by the FDA. And in fact, it wasn't even powered actually to show statistical significant differences between those two. But it was a, a post hoc analysis that could be done between dimethyl fumarate and glutamic acetate. And so we have trials that have looked to, to see whether there are differences. And again, sometimes you can see that. So in the TRANSFORMS trial, head-to-head -head against a beta interferon product did show superiority. Uh, when teraflunamod and beta interferon were looked at, there were no statistical differences that could be made between the two. And in the CONFIRM trial, when there was a comparison between the two, uh, they did show trends towards uh, a better response for the patients who are on DMF. Uh, but not reaching clinical significance uh, for, the, uh, for all of the, the outcomes that they were looking for. When comparing the orals to one another, uh, which has been a very important factor for us as well, uh, we, have, we have limitations in, in our ability to counsel our patients as to whether one of them is better than the other. Uh, the use of the oral disease modifying treatments has certainly grown. It's not that we don't have enough patients to be able to do that. It's just been there have not been head-to-head -head clinical trials that have been designed of a power in which we can say that one drug is better than another. That's not to say that, that observational databases can't be very helpful. And so it may be the patient selection. We choose one over another based on their clinical presentation or severity of the disease. But just looking at many thousands of patients over a period of time to try and figure out whether the outcome measures that we might be able to measure, like number of times they receive steroids or how often they go to physical therapy or number of hospitalizations, this is kind of databases that can be looked at to look at expenditures on the disease in an effort to tell us whether it is lessened for one drug over another. One way we can try to compare across trials, which is exceedingly difficult, is to, within the trial, do the calculations for number needed to treat. It's an interesting concept. How many people do you have to put on a medication so that one person doesn't have a relapse? or one person doesn't have com, uh, confirmed disability progression. These are ways of looking at the data in a, a different light. It's not uh, as a, uh, a just percentage reduction of the event. It, it's looking at the number of people that have to be on the medicine for this to happen. And, and that sometimes equalizes trials a little bit to be able to make these comparisons. So this is looking at numbers needed to treat, uh, to compare efficacy of the oral DMTs. And there are a number of trials that are down there. There are two trials each, the pivotal trials for DMF, for fingolimod, and teraflunamod. And I think as you go across, you can see the numbers are, are remarkably similar. In this case, the lower the bar, the fewer number of people had to be treated to prevent something. So that's actually the, the beneficial side of it. You want that number to be low. But what you see is that it's, it would be very difficult to look at this and be able to make any particular claims about superiority of one medication to another. If we look at the disability progression, this is where things got really different from one trial to the other. As I was mentioning, they could do two trials and get very different outcomes based on even how the placebo group did. And so if you look at the two DMF trials, those are very different bars. And if you uh, look at the Freedoms and Freedoms II trial, that also was, was quite different between those two. Uh, on the right-hand side, the teraflunamod, they're a little closer to one another than the other two are. And that was the one, if you remember, that both of the trials were able to show that, that they reduced the incidence of the confirmed disability progression. So you can see that they all end up in pooled analysis being fairly similar. 
Now we're going to move on to the third administration tactic that we have after talking about the injectables and talking about the orals. Now we're going to talk about the monoclonals. And so we have four monoclonal antibodies that are now approved uh, for the treatment of MS. Uh, when we look at the first one, which was natalizumab, that's the only one of the four that was compared to placebo. Uh, the other ones are active comparators in all the main clinical trials for the, their pivotal trial looking at uh, the reduction in relapse rate, uh, the newer enlarging lesions on an MRI, gadolinium enhancing lesions, and the risk of sustained disability progression. You can see the numbers are very robust favoring the drug over placebo. There were no head-to-head -head trials that were done with natalizumab against any other product at the time of its approval. Uh, and uh, because of that, it was, we weren't able to say at that time when it was released that we could make superiority claims. We just had to look at that information, those numbers, and then by th looking at things like number needed to treat, make assumptions about the efficacy of the medicine. And over time, certainly that's been borne out. If you look at alemtuzumab, which is the, the uh, next one to have had a an approval, it had head-to-head -head trial against interferon beta-1A44 micrograms subcutaneously three times a week, and they were looking at a number of outcome measures. The top line one was the annualized relapse rate. And the annualized relapse rate, you can see, was significantly lower for the alemtuzumab group versus the beta interferon, and the p-value was extremely good. When they looked at other outcome measures, the six-month sustained accumulation of disability, this is one of those instances where there was a prediction of the number of people on beta interferon that was going to have sustained disability worsening at the end of two years, and that number was, was much lower in reality. So it was only 11% for the patients who were uh, on the interferon, 8% for the patients who were on alemtuzumab, and that did not reach statistical significance. You can also look at the, the newer enhancing lesions, gadolinium enhancing lesions, see the based on MRI. Yes, there was uh, a, a clear treatment effect favoring the alemtuzumab group over the beta interferon group. Karamis 2 really is the study that's more pertinent to us in the United States, at least, that, uh, because it's for patients who had, had breakthrough activity on at, at least one drug in the past. And for this one, when they looked at the annualized relapse rate, you see the bars there that was cut in half for the, for the patients who are on alemtuzumab compared to interferon. And then when they looked at the, the outcomes for disability, the sustained accumulation of disability, either you know, at, at six months, what they were seeing was that, yes, it was a reduction from 21%, which is really what the number that they were expecting for interferon, versus 13% for alemtuzumab. What was seen also was sustained reduction in disability, and this is the first time that was really discussed in depth about a medication for people actually having clinical improvement that was measurable on the EDSS. And you can see it was 29% for the people on alemtuzumab and only 13% for on, on interferon. Again, statistically very significant. And then lastly, you have the two MRI parameters that we've already discussed before that, that very much favored alemtuzumab. So now we can go to, to the DECIDE trial, which is diclizumab versus beta-1A intramuscular interferon. And this one was uh, looked at in very much the same outcome measures as everything I've mentioned before. So the annualized relapse rate reduced by 45% compared to the interferon, the MRI, and the, the uh, sustained uh, accumulation of disability data, all favoring diclizumab. So we had outcome measures uh, in, in this trial that are typical across the board ones that we're going to look for, the relapses, the MRI, and the disability. There was another trial that was done on this, the SELECT trial, and, and that was a placebo-controlled trial, and it, again, of course, favored the drug. But uh, as we're talking about how we communicate with our patients about comparators, it's, it's very important, I think, that we have this kind of data. So when we go on now to ocrelizumab, the latest of the monoclonal antibodies to be FDA approved, uh, what we can see is that there were two trials that were done simultaneously, the OPERA 1 and OPERA 2 with same designs. And unlike what I had shown you on some of the other medications, especially uh, uh, some of the orals, there was a continuity that was seen in the data. It did look very similar from one trial to the other. So each of these bars is about the same between OPERA 1 and OPERA 2. And you can see that they looked again at those three things that I've mentioned again, relapses, uh, MRI, and progression of disability. 
and all of those reach statistical significance to varying degrees. So this is another head-to-head -head trial against beta-1a uh, subcutaneous interferon three times weekly uh, that shows a superiority claim that can be made uh, to that agent. So now as we're going through the, uh, these expectations, you know, when we're talking to patients about, well, we have all of these medicines, and here's what we know, here's what we don't know, uh, I think that it leads us to the conversations that we truly have to make the decision, the individualized decision, about how to get a medicine choice. So I'm gonna start with uh, Tracy. Tracy is a patient that uh, was referred after an, uh, a visit to the emergency room with significant vertigo and diplopia. That's something that will bring pretty much anybody to an emergency room. And certainly, uh, this is a patient who has reason to be very fearful about those symptoms, not knowing at the beginning whether it's gonna be a tumor or an aneurysm, something else. Uh, but as you can tell with the 25-year-old, a woman with an unremarkable medical history and an acute onset of these symptoms, MS is very much in the mix. And so when the MRI is done, that's, that's sort of the fork in the road as to what's going to be happening to this patient. What was found is that there were a, a number of lesions, scattered lesions, some enhancing, some non-enhancing. So just going on the criteria that we have for MS, what we find is that this patient, at the beginning, we already know what the, the, the diagnosis, and we also have some ideas about the prognosis based on the activity and that there's a brain stem lesion here. So this patient was put into the hospital, admitted to the hospital for IV steroids. Uh, you know, if, if you're thinking about what patients need to go into a hospital versus not, this is a patient that was unable to walk, unassisted, very dizzy, very nauseated. This is somebody who is going to come into the hospital for sure. And so now this patient is in the hospital getting acute care with, uh, with IV steroids and getting physical therapy, and they are trying to broach the subject of what the findings of the MRI are. And so the neurology residents and, and the attending physician in there talk about what the MRI looks like multiple sclerosis. And yes, in the long run, you're going to need to be on medicine for this. You're going to need treatment. Right now, what we have to focus on is getting you better and getting you out of the hospital. So we're going to give you the steroids. We're going to give you the physical therapy. And within a few days, I hope you're ready to go. And then you're going to follow up with a neurologist. And the neurologist is going to have that conversation with you about medications. And that's as far as the conversation goes. That's what Tracy gets when she leaves the hospital is you're going to go see somebody and make a decision about preventative medicines. So she goes home and she starts to read. And she reads and reads and reads. She has no one to really talk to about this. She just is going and trying to get the information because she knows when she goes in the decision is going to be made about medicine and she wants to know what kind of medicines are we even talking about here. And so, unfortunately, Tracy gets very fearful. She's reeling a lot of things on the internet that's not necessarily the best sources, and she's very, very frightened. So she doesn't know anybody with MS. She has no reference point to engage in conversation. She's just waiting for this appointment, okay? And she, when she comes in, she immediately expresses her fear. She's tearful from the onset, and it's not that she is resistant to the conversation. She's not there uh, against her better judgment. She knows she needs to be there, but she knows she needs to have a conversation and, and doesn't really know what to say. So the relapse recovery had been pretty good. So she came in, not all that symptomatic at all, but she was still traumatized by how dizzy she was, and she wasn't ready yet to get behind the wheel of a car, much less going to work. So she's talking right from the beginning about, I, I need time off from work. I need to be able to deal with this. And there's a lot of understanding about why somebody would have that opinion of the need to take the time to come to grips with the diagnosis and cope with it, but also be on the correct type of treatment. So what's the discussion about treatment? Where do we go from here? Well, the initial conversation has to be kind of limited. You're getting fact finding at the beginning, you're finding this, you're looking at the MRI, you're talking to her. But as soon as the conversation goes to, well, we have a number of different choices for medicines, and you know, I don't know whether you've, you, you've, you've given much thought to this, and well, clearly she had, but she felt very overwhelmed and pretty well shut down. I don't, I don't know what to do. I, you know, I, are you telling me that I need to be on medicine for the rest of my life? Are you telling me that I may be on a medicine that will hurt me? Uh, I'm feeling better. Can't I just change my lifestyle? Can't I just go on a, a better diet and exercise program? 
Well, the conversation then turns to the monitoring, because really in the order of things, you first have to set out your goals. Here's what I want to have happen. Well, to make that happen, you have to control the immune system. You have to bring it from way too high to where you want it. And you don't want to go too low, because then you're more prone to infections or other complications. And so why don't we get some blood work to find out where you are in this? And so I'll show you this sort of panel that's done. She was resistant to the idea of treatment, but not resistant to the idea of this workup to be able to get to that informed decision. And so at that point, ordering labs, treatment is kind of tabled until that is back. So there's a number of labs that come back and you can see the laboratories are, are, are fairly normal. Uh, the, the JCV antibody status was positive. Uh, there is nothing in the, in the history or physical that is a comorbidity that would complicate this picture. And importantly, in a discussion about pregnancy, uh, she has an IUD in place, and the IUD uh, was a decision that she made because she does not plan on pregnancy in the near future. Now, in the story, which I kind of glossed over, she came into this appointment with a boyfriend who remained dead silent during the entire conversation, never said a word. So support team or not support team? So when she comes back, uh, she now has found out that she understands more about it. She understands the importance of treatment uh, and she, she understands the reasons why to be able to thwart any worsening of disability. So she had felt like, okay, I understand this, this slowing down the disease is being necessary, but still was resistant to the medicine to the extent of, of not wanting to overplay the hand. Uh, but by stating that I had an expectation of improvement, then the key questions to ask were, how do you prefer to take your medicines? You know, is this, is this an important aspect of it to you? How much risk are you willing to accept? What's your flexibility with the laboratory monitoring? And what are your goals for treatment? And so before she came back in, she was sort of given this assignment of what to think about. And then she found out she had a much better support system than she thought. She had people who told her about positive responses and actually was able to speak to somebody else in the clinical practice who really actively explained what they had gone through and be able to put uh, themselves on the same page. So at the next follow-up, she had decided that she wanted to go on an oral medicine, that she has pills did appeal to her much more than the alternatives that she was being given. We had risk factors that sort of swayed us away from medications, and she was very flexible about the need for laboratory monitoring. That was not an issue for her. And so the idea was, all right, I've defined what I want. I know what the monitoring is. I accept the monitoring that will be necessary to be on the medication. And so based on all of that put together, this patient did decide, even at a young age of 25, to go on teraflunamod because of her stated uh, expectations of not being pregnant for, for several years and wanting to be on an oral medication that for her fit the, the risk benefit uh, uh, expectations that she had about her disease. So it's a very difficult conversation and, and, and a, a very similar patient may end up with a completely different answer. But by having this stepwise conversation, I'm hoping that you understand how a patient may be informed to lead to this, uh, this combined effort to get to uh, the decision of where to go. Dr. Fox talked about the need or the desire to achieve disease stability for a patient at the outset of treatment. And I think that that is a very fundamental goal. And although we have a, a wonderful array of medicines, the problem remains that we can't always achieve that goal. And so I'm going to take this next portion of the program and talk about the therapeutic alliance and the data that we have to guide us for a patient with highly active or worsening relapsing MS. So our clinical trials, for the most part, tell us the fundamentals of efficacy of these medicines. The reduction in relapse rate, the prevention of new lesions, and the prevention of disability. But what we don't always know from the core clinical trial is what will happen for patients who have breakthrough disease, who have a worsening course, uh, for whom we may want to switch their therapy. Now, this talk is not going to talk about prognostic signs and, and the impact of breakthrough disease on clinical course. There are many wonderful lectures and articles about that. But what we're going to look at specifically here is how we can look at our clinical trial data to try and inform our decisions regarding individual therapies. So we look at efficacy in our trials, as you just heard, through our, our primary outcome measures. And 
when we think about how we translate uh, the efficacy in a clinical trial to real world effectiveness, we have to take into account the specifics of the patient that's before us, her comorbidities, her treatment history, her perspective, as you just heard. And we have to apply our data to these individual patients as best we can. Now, breakthrough disease is looked at in clinical trials, but this is not how trials are typically positioned. These are usually trials whose end goal is to show whether a medicine is effective or not and justify its approval. But we can look in more detail at the data regarding breakthrough disease in those trials to help guide us in these clinical circumstances. And furthermore, we can look at more real world studies with uh, matched cohorts, and we'll look a little bit at that type of data and the limitations invoked. Now, many trials of our disease-modifying therapies enroll patients who have been treated before. And so for all of those patients, there is the notion here as to what happens when they are switched or brought into a clinical trial and treated with a new medication. So we can look for disease activity in patients that went into a clinical trial and look at whether they were treated beforehand. Most of the time at the end of our registration trials, at the end of our core uh, pivotal trials, we have extension phases. Now that can provide very useful information about the longer term efficacy and safety of our medicines. But extension trials where patients who were randomized to placebo, or to the control group now are switched on to the new medication are effectively switch trials. And they can tell us something important about breakthrough disease and switching patients in that context. Now, I'm gonna go very briefly through a series of trials here just to hit some high points of efficacy data for patients with breakthrough disease in our core pivotal trials. But let's look for a moment at the pivotal trials that you heard about already and, and look at them from the perspective of breakthrough disease. So we have the pivotal trials for dimethylfumarate, define and confirm. So we can look at what highly active disease constitutes in these trials. These were patients um, who had had highly active disease defined as having greater than or equal to two relapses within a year before enrolling. Now I should point out that the big you know, clinical trials are powered for their primary endpoint and everything I'm gonna to say to you from here on are subgroups. So these are gonna be smaller groups of patients. We have less statistical power. We have greater uncertainty, but I think it does tell us something applicable to our patients with breakthrough disease. So here we have 161 patients from define and confirm. And what we see here is that there was a reduction in relapse rate of 56% and a reduction in the development of disability progression of 78% in those patients versus treated with placebo. So that gives us a sense of what we can expect from this medicine in this type of population of patient. We can turn and look at the same sort of analysis from the pivotal trials of teraflutamide, Tempso, and Tower. So here we have somewhat different definitions of the high disease activity subgroup. Oftentimes, gadolinium enhancing lesions at baseline serve to help to define our highly active subgroup. So you think of your patients on a medication with breakthrough disease, with GAD enhancing lesions, those are the sorts of patients that we're looking at here in these subgroup analyses. And you see here a reduction in annualized relapse rate for teraflutamide in this group of 35%, and an even better in these case uh, reduction in confirmed disability of 46 and 40% uh, respectively with the two different definitions of duration of confirmed disability. So this is in line with what we saw from teraflutamide in the core pivotal trials as Dr. Fox outlined. Turning to fingolimod, the Freedoms Trials 1 and 2 here, looking at this in a somewhat different way. So Dr. Fox talked about trying to uh, achieve stability for our patients, and I think that that is the fundamental and, and often achievable goal. But we can be even more aspirational and talk about no evidence of disease activity and try and achieve that. And then we can raise the bar even further and say, well, what if we not only prevented relapses, lesions, and disability, but also prevented a worsening of brain atrophy 
since we know this is important prognostically, to try and slow down brain atrophy to the normal rate. That is to say, the rates that our brains are atrophying right now. So that's what we call NIDA4, no relapses, no lesions, no disability, and a, a cessation of rapid brain atrophy. And if we look at whether that was achieved in the highly active uh, disease group, we can see that that was achieved for fingolimod in 20% of the patients compared with only 3.9% of placebo. This makes sense. We're setting a very high bar for efficacy, a bar that placebo is not able to achieve, but in that trial, fingolimod did. How about in the alentuzumab trials, um, the CARAMS-1 and, and in this case, CARAMS-2? Now, CARAMS-2 was def uh, defined as enrolling patients who'd been previously treated with other disease-modifying therapies. So here, the entire population are patients who'd had disease activity while being treated. And so we can look here and see the extent to which no evidence of disease activity, here called freedom from disease activity, was achieved in alemtuzumab versus its comparator arm, which was interferon beta given three times a week. So we see clinical disease activity in this population of highly active patients. You see freedom from MRI activity in 40% versus 7.5. But I'll call your attention to the bar graph on the right. We presented these data here at CMSC a few years ago now, but 24% of the alemtuzumab treated patients with highly active disease achieved no evidence of disease activity, but 0% of the patients that were treated with interferon. And I think that this goes to show what happens to a population of people with breakthrough highly active disease who are showing that they are breaking through the type of medicine that they've been treated with before. This, I think, paints a picture of an unmet need and the extent to which alentuzumab was able to achieve that goal. Finally, turning to the SELECT trial, um, looking at highly active disease in the Diclizumab trial versus placebo. This is an earlier trial in a smaller group, but here again we see pretty solid efficacy on relapse ground and on MRI grounds um, against uh, placebo in this highly active cohort. None of these medicines have been perfect. And so I think part of the therapeutic alliance with our patients is understanding what we can achieve potentially and trying to set achievable goals. Now, these are all based on the core trials and longer term extension data can give us a little bit more insight into what happens once we've changed patients from one arm into the extension. So I'll just show you the alentuzumab studies again here because I think they're a good example of this. At the conclusion of the alentuzumab versus interferon studies, patients could be placed onto alentuzumab and then followed out for several years. And so you see here, these were data presented last year looking at five-year outcomes in the alentuzumab-treated patients. These were highly active uh, patients, again, defined as having two or more relapses and enhancing lesions when they went into the study, and we're looking at no evidence of disease activity. It's not perfect, to be sure, but these are the patients with the most highly active breakthrough disease now being followed five years out, keeping in mind that with this particular agent, with alemtuzumab, the majority of these patients weren't treated again. They were followed out looking at the more durable uh, mechanism or influence of the drug. So I think it gives us some sense of what we can expect from even our self, you know, so described high potency agents in the long term. I'm going to just speak very briefly about uh, registry trials. We do have uh, these prospective registries where patients can be quasi-randomized using things like propensity scores and sensitivity analyses. These are ways of trying to control for the things that we know about. The problem with these and what separates them from true randomized clinical trials is we can't control for the things that we can't measure. We can't control for the things that we can't see. So true randomized studies randomize for things that we do know about, and at least in theory, randomize for the things that we don't. That said, we can learn something from these studies. And here you see a group looking at uh, outcomes with breakthrough disease being switched to natalizumab or fingolimod. We see that both agents worked quite well in this setting, reducing an annualized relapse rate from 1.5 to 0.2, or 1.3 to 0.4, and then we can look at analyses separating these two. 
to try and gauge in clinical practice the benefits of changing a medication when someone has breakthrough disease. So I'm going to stop there from the didactic point, and I'm going to turn to my story that I think helps to paint the picture of how I've come to think about this problem in clinical practice and maintaining a therapeutic alliance. So I'm going to tell you a story about a patient. We'll call her Maggie. Um, but this is a real patient of mine. So back in 2008, she was diagnosed with MS when she had optic neuritis and a pretty substantial lesion burden even right at the outset of her disease, which you see here. She was started initially on interferon beta 1b, but rather promptly developed another exacerbation with left leg weakness from a cervical myelopathy. And you can see both cervical and high thoracic myelopathy here on her MRI scan. She was treated with steroids. That left leg weakness did get better. But this was a pretty significant event for her, and her disease-modifying therapy was changed. Now, in the ensuing years, she did not do as well as we would have liked, even on that second medication. You can see her scans done over the subsequent years showed a very substantial increase in disease burden. And she was switched from one agent to another, and then rather promptly to natalizumab at that time. Now, even though she had breakthrough disease on her MRI scan, the only symptom that ever really troubled her was weakness in that left foot. This was the relapse that she'd had. And even though it had gotten fully better, she was never quite able to wear heels. And then her left leg would give out after she'd walked a longer distance. And then the left leg would start to give out and her foot would drag after she'd only walked a block or two. So this was a big concern, of course, to her and to me. But I would point out that even though her brain MRI was changing with new lesions, the symptom that was causing her disability, the version of her MS, her pattern of disease that was worsening gradually over these years, was related to that relapse that she'd had. And it, it called to mind for me the idea that progression, if and when it occurs, often recapitulates those same signs and symptoms that someone experienced during their relapsing course. So I started to think about how one might depict this and conceptualize it. And so I started to think of it as there was something under the surface for this patient and patients like her that was gradually starting to be revealed. And this was one of the early sketches that I'd made of what became the topographical model of MS. So, you know, I, I thought of the disease topography for a patient as reflecting where her lesions were and what she'd experienced under the surface, and the ability to compensate for that as being this water level. And that what progression reflected was that water level declining as she's losing reserve, and those areas are being revealed. Now, I wrote localization on this early sketch, but I hadn't yet figured out what the big driver was here, and that is she had cord lesions. She had cord lesions that were driving her clinical course. It's the cord lesions that were showing themselves preferentially. And so in subsequent drawings, the spinal cord became the shallow end of this pool, where lesions have a much greater predilection to cross that clinical threshold and cause the kinds of left leg symptoms, in this case, that she was experiencing. So the shallow end in this later drawing um, was you know, there to show areas like the spinal cord and the optic nerve, where this patient had experienced her symptoms, whereas areas of higher reserve, the deep end of the pool, the hemispheres, even though she developed new lesions there, they were under the threshold. We couldn't see them above the threshold. We couldn't see them clinically. So we started to flesh this out, and uh, I worked with a group of people at uh, an agency called Harrison and Starr. This was the first time I ever met them. I'm going to show you a series of pictures of how we developed this model from a whole series of sketches into what it is now, as Dr. Fox mentioned, this app, which is now on the App Store uh, for iPad called MS Topography. This was a group of, of creative directors and visual artists and coders and really interesting creative people who helped me to develop this and realize it. And they did it pro bono because they were interested in contributing something to the field. And, and I don't think we could have known that day when this shot was taken what all we were getting ourselves into. But artists drew other renderings of it over time. We had innumerable meetings where we tried to capture the nuances of patient stories like the one I'm telling you about. 
we storyboarded patient stories and you can see a dozen people here trying to figure out where the lesions would go and how the tank would look, what would cross the threshold and what wouldn't, how we could make it true to life. We had all sorts of different sizes of these lesions, how they would recover, how the water level would behave, rendered over and over again. Finally, we designed it as this pool and realized it, it really needed to be something that people could interact with. Clinicians to look at it, patients to better understand it. Here's a team including uh, uh, Karen Cook to my left and Eric Gorka to my right, who helped design and code respectively this whole app. And ultimately it looks something like this. I kind of consider this a centerpiece of my life's work. It really came from looking carefully at patients and what their breakthrough disease looked like. This was ultimately first presented at the AAN in 2015, and it was written up as a piece in Scientific American, uh, and then ultimately published this past year uh, in Neurology's MS journal called uh, Neuroimmunology and Neuroinflammation. But I want to add one more little nuance to this story, which is when I first showed this at the AAN meeting, people's response to it was positive. They said, this is really interesting. I think it does a good job of showing the disease, but don't ever show that to a patient. Then I presented it a month later at CMSC with a group of, to a group of people who are interested in comprehensive care, perhaps with a more you know, entrenched patient care focus. And they said, this is great. Let's use this to teach patients. Let's show this to them and help them understand this disease better. And I thought that was really an interesting dichotomy. And I thought about it, and I think the reason why people were nervous about sharing it with patients, but also people who take care of patients wanted to use it to teach them, is because it's honest. I think it's an honest look at what's above the threshold and below. It paints a picture of the sorts of things that concern us. And I think to have conversations with our patients about breakthrough disease, about changing therapy, about what we're worried about, we have to be able to do that honestly. And so I, my hope is that the app will help to foster those sorts of honest conversations. So let's bring it back to Maggie for a moment, because time has continued to pass. She's 38, and in fact, on um, an oral agent, she was on natalizumab for four years, became JC virus positive, and, and opted to promptly switch, uh, and as she did, to dimethyl fumarate. She's been stable now for the past four or five years. She's had no new relapses, and that left leg, although it still bothers her, she's been able to stabilize quite well. She has a very extensive health and fitness regimen. She was someone that first told me what P90X was a few years ago. This is the kind of thing that she does. And I think in that way, she's a good example of our treatment to try and keep the topography flat, keep the patient from developing new loci of disease, but also someone who's taken a very positive health uh, you know, related behaviors into her life and does a lot of things that I view in the model as keeping the tank full, keeping reserve built uh, and not letting things worsen if it can be avoided. So I think the app is useful to discuss shared decision making. I think it paints a picture of a lot of things that we think about, relapses, lesions, disability, but does it in a visual way that is comprehensible for patients. So. Okay, so you heard Dr. Fox talk about you know, the shared decision making process and looking at efficacy data and Dr. Krieger, you know, about the breakthrough disease. So what we're gonna do is talk about managing expectations and trying to allay some of those fears about the, the adverse events or the side effects and safety monitoring and how it's involved in the shared decision-making process. All right, there's considerable variation, really, of safety and tolerability the profiles that we're looking for for the disease-modifying therapies they range from very mild and manageable tolerability issues such as injection site reactions or flu-like symptoms or lab abnormalities to very potential life-threatening thre risks. So for some of the DMTs, the discussion with patients on the risks and the benefits is much more complex conversation.
that we have. And the shared decision-making process itself, really, it's influenced by the patient's individual risk perception. So when the decision of therapy is actually made, the patient should be leaving that office with a personalized plan of action. So when we're presenting glutarimer acetate to patients, I think one of the first things that we think about is the long-term safety data that we have um, uh, at least 23 years. Um, the monitoring, there isn't any monitoring that's required prior to treatment nor during the treatment. Um, so what we're really going to focus on is maybe some of the adverse events that they might experience, the injection site reactions, you know, how we can mitigate those. They need to be very much aware about the post-injection reaction, that it's not a life-threatening situation, and how we can avoid any situation where we might see some lipoatrophy, and that is going to be with the injection technique. We, you know, used to, a long time ago, many of us, used to do the injection training in the office anymore. And it's been so wonderful for us that we have the home nursing, the trainers that'll go into the home and make the patient feel very comfortable. It's very convenient for them. So it really makes going on an injectable medication much, much easier, an easy process. So when we're looking at the interferons, um, some of the common side effects that we deal with maybe are flu-like symptoms or injection site reactions. And we're going to talk about how we're actually going to really mitigate that. Um, the recommended baseline labs uh, is, include checking a CBC, LFTs, and TSH. And we're going to do that prior to treatment and intermittent monitoring throughout. And you may have your own personal protocol as far as your clinic on when you're going to check them. And what we do is we'll initiate the patient. We'll do it prior to initiating, maybe uh, about a month afterward, a month to three months. We'll do it again at six months, 12 months. And then we continue to do it every six months after that. So the, there are really some therapies that have greater efficacy profiles, and we have more diligent safety monitoring. So it's very important to really stress to the patient that the monitoring is really specifically set there for the patient's safety. And adherence to that monitoring is a, it's critical. It's crucial in identifying any of the adverse events that we may. And we can identify them early on. If we can catch them early, we can treat them, we can manage them. So fingolimod is actually an oral medication, uh, tolerated very well. I think headache, diarrhea, back pain, there's just a few of the mild side effects that we can actually manage symptomatically. But the safety concerns really are related to the first dose monitoring and some of the possible cardiac interactions and the potential long-term effects of the lymphopenia. A VZV titer needs to be checked prior to dosing, as well as a CBC and LFTs. Uh, an eye exam is done prior and three months afterwards, checking for any signs of macular edema. And we also monitor the liver enzymes and possible hypertension. The home FDO first dose observation program that is available has made our life in the office uh, so much easier. And it provides a sense of comfort and convenience for the patient. Um, just does not require you to be in a medical facility to do the first dose observation. Teraflunamide is also tolerated very well, oral medication. We actually have about nine years of exposure with this. The most common adverse events include mild headache and diarrhea, um, which I've seen in clinical practice, and a trend maybe for elevated ALT, so we'll have to monitor that. But as far as the hair loss, uh, we've seen it. It typically pretty much resolves shortly after it starts. A pregnancy test definitely needs to be done and should be negative. Um, as well as a discussion on effective birth control. Um, TB screen, baseline ALT with bilirubin, they're included actually in the baseline labs. And the ALT is monitored monthly for six months after starting. So what we have, we have our standing orders actually set up for the local lab for the patients to get those done. 
dimethylfumarate, the most common AEs for flushing and GI issues, and it's been very helpful in our practice to actually send the patient home with written instructions. And that's concerning our clinic protocol on titration. We also send them home with a what to do tip sheet. Okay, these are uh, over-counter medications that we advise that they're very appropriate to use when they're experiencing certain side effects. And it also lets them know when we want them to call the office. Okay, both sheets have been very successful really in not only initiating but in maintaining the patient on therapy. So labs prior to treatment include CBC monitoring for lymphocyte count, LFTs. Um, CBC is to be monitored six months after initiation and every six to 12 months thereafter. And of course, the LFTs as clinically indicated. Natalizumab is a very well tolerated infusion. Here's a list of the most common AEs. It includes the JCV antibody testing. Um, the lab monitoring does, and the MRIs prior to initiation. Um, I think as far as some of the most common AEs that we may hear, uh, because it is tolerated so well, maybe headache, maybe fatigue, um, but you know those can be symptomatically treated if they do happen. What's been really, really helpful in the discussion on the shared decision making is actually the PML risk stratification. Uh, it's really been essential in giving us guidance on identifying the three risk factors. And when we're talking to the patient, I, the patient understands or has a good idea of what one in a thousand means or three in a thousand, a much better idea than actually dealing with percentages. So the graph is, is great visual in explaining to patients the risk of PML. And that's part of the decision. Elemtuzumab, here's a profile of the AEs. And most of what we see on here are actually infusion-associated reactions, with the exception of the thyroid disorders, which is at about 34%. And is something that we definitely do discuss before we actually start. Um, there is a REMS program that's in place, specific labs are required, certain evaluations, which include a skin exam. And so the discussion does center on a few things. It's really with the patients, the dosing regimen, you know, the five days, the first year, 12 months later, three days, the logistics of the whole infusion process. You know, how are we gonna do this? We're gonna start it at this time. We're gonna, this is what we're gonna do during the day, and this is what we're gonna do afterwards, as far as that's concerned. Um, the monitoring up to 40 months afterwards, and the importance of actually doing the monitoring. Uh, safety is the first concern. So this slide actually gives us a snapshot of monitoring that's required monthly, you know, every three months and in the REMS program. This is designed to show any AEs early. We can detect them early, we can manage them, we can treat it. Uh, most of the AEs actually were present within the 48 months. This is why they are monitored the 48 months afterwards. And I think when you discuss the REM programs with the patient, um, and, and specify and stress the fact that this is really there for the safety of the patient. I think that they actually feel a sense of comfort in that. And that's part of it. The lab program's in place and it is for the patient's convenience. They can do it at the office at home um, and well as they do cover the cost of the labs. Daclizumab. This also has a REMS program in place, and the most common AEs include cutaneous reactions that we see. The monthly dosing is very appealing to the patients, and I think at this point, uh, knowing that there is no PML associated with the medication can be uh, very comforting to the patient. There are labs required prior to treatment, and the required monthly lab monitoring prior to each dose actually involves options for the patients. The lab costs are covered under the REMS program. So we have convenience. Ocrelizumab. This infusion is actually tolerated very well. Most of the AEs include upper respiratory tract infections and just mild infusion reactions. The pre-medication prior to infusion has been very successful in mitigating any re infusion reactions. Uh, prior to treatment, a hep B screen 
is required. However, we have additional lab evaluations that we'd like to have the patients have done prior to initiating, which is our protocol. And we also discuss the breast cancer guidelines with the patient. So whatever therapy the patient's initiating, they should really have a good understanding of what the goals of therapy are and what the real expectations of therapy are. Um, what's involved in their commitment to go on therapy, they have to buy into the fact that this therapy may require specific monitoring. Let's talk about risk assessment. What is it? It is a complex process involving the information of evidence-based risk and potential benefits, clinical practice, expertise, which is extremely important, and it involves the management of individualized and very realistic patient perceptions. Okay, so this is the story of Caitlin. Caitlin is a 32 years old mother. She has two boys. She was diagnosed back in 2005. That was when she was in her 20s. Uh, she's currently working as a copy editor for a publishing company, and she has a great job. Um, until recently, she was actually under the care of a, a community neurologist, okay? So this is her tra trajectory of practice. Uh, she started on glutiramer acetate back in 2005. Um, she had some issues with injection site reactions, okay? They were very difficult for her to manage. And so what we saw with that was the poor adherence. So she was actually taking maybe four, maybe five injections instead of the, the daily injections. And at some point, she had a very mild relapse. However, with this relapse, she did have a full recovery, like she had with the relapses before when she was actually diagnosed. But she did have an increase of T2 lesions on her MRI. So the decision was made in 2007 to stop glutiramer acetate and start interferon beta 1A three times a week. Okay. So, um, in 2007, when she started the interferon, she, we were able to really, you know, pre-medicate the, uh, to uh, take care of the flu-like symptoms. And as far as the injection site reactions, they were very mild, but they were much fewer than what she had before. She liked the regimen Monday, Wednesday, Friday. It just seemed to fit and work into her lifestyle. And then in between 2008, 2011, she had two boys, and of course, she stopped the interferon prior to the pregnancy. Um, and then about six weeks postpartum, had a follow-up MRI that was done. She had increased activity on the MRI. So the decision was actually made to go back on the interferon. So she did after each pregnancy. She resumed it. So in 2012, she had a pretty serious relapse. And she had a very much an incomplete recovery. So this was the first time she was actually having some residual symptoms. She was actually referred to our clinic at this time. And uh, really, the, we initiated the conversation on and looking at her past medical history and what she had been on, uh, talking about something more efficacious to change to. So the options that were actually discussed at this time that were available were natalizumab and fingolimod. She was JCV antibody negative, but it really took two years of discussion, you know, when she would come in for her visits and educating the patient to accept that and a more efficacious treatment was really needed. So natalizumab was discussed, although a seronegative possibility of PML was actually still very scary to her. So she was afraid at this time to make a change. So the decision was to remain on interferon beta 1i, and we would follow up probably in about six months. So being on the injectables, you know, she had very ambivalent feelings about changing. She really felt that it, she had a sense of comfort. It had been 10 years. You know, she actually had had uh, some success with, or she felt, with the injectables. But what she was really dealing with was shot fatigue. It had been over 10 years at that point. And I think that the process of giving the injection for her was becoming much more arduous. And she just 
felt like she had to think about her MS every day. So um, never, nevertheless, at each follow-up appointment, there was education. We discussed looking at more efficacious therapy and really examining her quality of life. However, all right, she experienced a life-changing event. Um, she went through a very nasty divorce uh, in 2015. It was a very, very, very difficult time for her. But it was a time for us to think about reevaluating her disease progression that she was dealing with. It really enabled her to uh, reassess the risks that were associated with a new therapy. She now had this life-changing event. She's primary caretaker, primary breadwinner. Um, the side effects, she was having a difficult time dealing with the flu-like symptoms and the injection reactions, and she just felt she was too busy to juggle it. She was still JCV antibody negative, so we discussed the options, and at that time, the three options that we looked at were natalizumab, fingolimod, and alemtuzumab. So it was a shared decision to, that was made to actually switch to alemtuzumab. And a couple of the factors that drove to that decision was, number one, we looked at her life cycle. She had her, had her two boys. She wasn't planning on having any more children at this point. Um, she had a very successful job. Uh, but the goals, her primary goal was juggling work and family. Number one priority. That was her goal. And so when we looked at alemtuzumab, the time commitment to therapy was very important to her. She, the dosing regimen was appealing. And we felt the lab surveillance that she needs, she understood, but it could be very convenient because she could have it done at the office or she could have it done at home, whichever one. So she had the two courses when she came in. You know, one thing she said, she was not constantly reminded of her MS. She could actually pretty much forget about it. So she came to understand the importance of the safety monitoring and the REMS program that was put in place. She understood that the side effects, if we can catch them early, we can treat them, we can manage them. Um, and she, at that point, was given sufficient education over time. And it did take a while. And each patient's gonna be totally, they're totally individual in how much time it may take them to think about, am I ready to change therapy? I really need to look at, um, she felt that she could make a positive impact, really, on changing her quality of life. And actually, she did. So really, some of the key points to remember is that the trusting relationship is so extremely important. Um, and that, in itself, takes time. But that helps with the education process and um, with the, the relationship you know, that you have. Assessing the risks, especially when you're talking about switching therapies, is extremely important. Um, educating and reaffirming those goals at each visit and evaluating the effectiveness of the me medication. But you also have to be aware, you need to be able to recognize when that patient may be ready to make a change and what is their risk assessment you know, at that time. Uh, the ongoing education about the risk and benefits of the avail available therapies was really important, as well as the real world data. And this is where it's just so important for us to have those extension studies and have that safety data to discuss with the patients. That's part of the shared decision making process. So I think that um, managing realistic expectations concerning the prayer therapy is another thing. Um, understanding the impact of life-changing events, this can actually prompt the patient to actually self-reflect and reevaluate the risks associated with actually pursuing a different therapy. I think the key take-home messages we've gotten on this is that uh, 
Uh, we don't have an easy algorithm for this, but uh, the, the idea of having a one-size-fits-all is something we know doesn't exist. And we wanted to have a few stories that we could give here uh, tonight to be able to sort of explain our thought process on this. Uh, and so, uh, you know, having these tools that we have now that are downloadable may be able to allow the patients to enter into the educational process and the involvement in the conversation to a much greater degree. That is what we're hoping. So uh, let's go ahead and, and see if there are any questions. I believe there's going to be a microphone that can be, uh, can be walked around uh, if anybody does have any questions or comments before we wrap up. Oh, I do have one written question here. All right. So the, the question that's being posed, and we can all certainly chime in on this one, is how do we choose induction therapy in MS treatment? I think that's a, uh, that's, a, that's a hot topic, definitely. A lot of conversation this week about that. The idea of escalation therapy starting with a, a sort of a, a base therapy and then building up to a more efficacious if need be uh, versus the, uh, the induction therapy, which means starting at a higher level and then backing off if necessary for safety measure. And then how do we decide to use the monoclonal antibodies and B-cell depletion therapies? Are we going to consider that to be induction therapy or not? And so uh, I think that all of us have, have talked about those things that we perceive as bad prognostic factors. They may be subtle, but we do have those. And so uh, you know, I think the, the answer that we would all have on this induction therapy is if we see enough to be concerned, we're going to have that conversation about our concerns about the disease and how we're going to fit that to our beliefs about the medications, whether they be the B-cell depleters or others. I don't know if uh, you want to add to that or... And I might add the concept that a traditional induction strategy is one that has a very durable impact on the immune system. And so we don't have that many medications that fall into that category that are, you know, in our approved armamentarium. Alentuzumab would be in that category, but at least in this country, it's approved as a second or third line agent for the most part. Ocrelizumab you can think of as an induction therapy, but it does need to be redosed every six months in order to maintain the efficacy as we've seen in trials. So I think one can have a middle ground in essence and say that you can start treating a patient to a goal of stable disease, mm -hmm. but to not be complacent about it. If a patient is showing signs that their disease is not stable, um, then to rapidly change them to a, a, a different mechanism of action or one that can bring about a, a better response. So I, I think I'm a little bit less of a purist about induction versus escalation, mm -hmm. rather to say I think we just need to be uh, responsive to the patient and not complacent about disease activity. So, Laura, do you well, find that uh, this conversation comes up repeatedly? It does. It comes up quite often. And, uh, you know, I think we really need to think about, I mean, you talked about the prognostic factors, and definitely that all comes in the conversation. But I think that as providers, you also need to really look at your experience and your experience using these medications um, and dealing with uh, different prognostic factors of disease. Yeah, I think that uh, patients are, are very much differ in what their desires are with regards to being on a newer medicine versus one that's been established. Mm -hmm. uh, databases, we've all mentioned this, that we really want to have long-term follow-ups. It's at this kind of program that mm -hmm. this week we find out this sort of data that we have to bring back to the patients because online information may be lacking for them. Mm -hmm. they, they, they are not able to uh, necessarily send materials from the companies that produce the products. They have to get it from, from other sources. He has a question there. Yes. Yes, a very nice presentation, very informative, really timely. It's great to have these treatment options for patients and be in the situation versus where we were a little more than 20 years ago. My question to you is about ocrelizumab. Uh, I'm getting questions from my patients about the potential breast cancer signal that was seen with eight cases of breast cancer in among the three trials, plus all the supplementary data that they showed in those papers, uh, versus with rituximab, there didn't seem to be that increased signal. So I wanted to just get your take on that. Anyone on the panel who'd like to comment, how, how do you think through that and how do you present that potential issue to patients? Um, I'll start the conversation by just talking about labeling by the FDA. I think the FDA's job 
or any other regulatory agency is to give us the information that they have at hand. Uh, it's not specifically to tell us exactly how to use that information and what sort of monitoring. It's been my opinion on this one that when you have any safety signal, it does inform you as to what you should be discussing with the patient in regards to preventative care. And uh, it's been well known and, and published so many times at CMSC meetings about uh, a lack of good primary care for patients with MS. They often don't see the primary care doctor and they don't get as high a screening rate for things like cancers or, or uh, other problems. And so I would conform certainly to the recommendations that are already out there for uh, repeated mammograms uh, as per normal scheduling. Uh, and to make sure that all these things have been done and discussed before the initiation of therapy and to be able to communicate well with the other doctors, whether it be a gynecologist, a, a primary care doctor of any sort, to explain why this is now on our radar. And although we don't have specific answers, we're going to be looking at it in the debase, databases over time. I mean, I think that's a perfect answer. Yeah, I would add only that all of our modern medicines bring with them risks known and unknown. And one of the challenges with a newly approved medicine is we have more unknowns with it. And I think this is a perfect example of one of them where breast cancer is not an uncommon event, unfortunately, in, in, in adult women. And so distinguishing whether that was truly related to the medicine, I think, mm -hmm. is difficult at this point. One of the one of the challenges there is it's not something that we're going to be able to screen for and diagnose ourselves, to your point, Dr. Fox. PML is a terrible outcome, but at least we in this room don't need anyone else to help us look for it. It's a neurological disease, and it's one that's totally in our purview to screen for, look for, recognize, and address. But breast cancer is not. We don't do those exams in our own practice, and I think we do need an informed patient and an alliance with the rest of, of her or his for that matter. It's not only women that could get breast cancer. I think we need to discuss that with all of our patients. Um, I think they need to be themselves informed and then also make sure that their general providers are informed to be part of that screening team. So Laura, you may have something to add to that, but I'd also <laughs> question you as having been involved in so many clinical trials where there are many things that are expected and they want other specialists involved. And so you're dealing with other medical subspecialties. The, do you feel that uh, there's now an increasing acceptance by other doctors that, okay, they're part of a, a group, a team approach to care? I, I, I agree that started with the clinical trials when we started having to have additional evaluations, you know, by the ophthalmologist, you know, by the pulmonologist and the dermatologist, and, you know, what's required really in the monitoring. Um, one of the difficult things, I think, in, is that patients sometimes think of their MS specialist as being their only doctor, and I think that um, the women's, the gynecologist, gynecological exams, the annual exams, are very important for them to have those done also. All right, any other questions? We have a written one? Yes. All right, here's the last question for you. So is sequencing or exit strategy part of this? What is communicated with the patient in the shared decision-making process? Uh, I, I think that's another very, very good question and, and obviously a hot topic. So sequencing and exit strategy, uh, I, I think that, you know, we can take this in turn. I don't have to answer it first on each one of these. But, uh, you know, we've, we've talked about sequencing. What about the opposite side of it? You know, I think since this is really a discussion of shared decision making, you know, what, I, what I'll take from this is, I always talk to patients about what the next step medicine mm -hmm. might be for them. So whatever they're on, even if it's going well and we're going to have no intention of changing it, I've at least discussed something about the next possible step for them so that if something arises, a relapse, a change on the MRI, an adverse event, whatever it may be, the patient already knows that there will be a plan in place. Mm -hmm. It's gonna vary enormously patient to patient and DMT to DMT, but I'm always trying to convey to them that whatever we're doing, uh, the world is not over if we have to change it. 
And so there's always some discussion of exit strategy or next step sequence that I have with the patient um, so that it's not the first time they ever hear about it in a moment of duress. That's the one point I would add. Well, I, I agree with that, that each patient has their own individualized plan. I think in plan of action, and I, I think they need to know from the provider, you know, um, what, what that plan actually involves. And I do think that exit strategy is something that we'll be looking at in the future, that we all want biomarkers to be able to determine when disease okay. quiescence may occur long term and the ability to get off of the medicine. That is certainly a goal that we all have. Thank you again for your attendance. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Thank you for listening to this activity. To view the rest of the CME, CE, CPE activity, download materials, and complete the post-test for instant credit, please go online to www.peerviewpress.com forward slash xdg. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Sanofi Genzyme.